So thank you all for being here. I think this 20 is all of our plans are disrupted, right? This is the reality. Um, and for those of us who study women's suffrage, that's been particularly disappointing in this centennial year. We're here virtual and we're all learning to be creative um, has led to lots of great uh, new pop, new uh, uh, opportunities, etc. So I did an event last night in Indy from my office, and I did an event in DC last week from my office, um, and and so it's exciting to see those things uh, sort of go forward. Um, so I'm a political scientist at the University of Notre Dame. I have never been in this building, but I want to live here now. Um, this is gorgeous. One of the things my husband and I love. About is all the older homes uh, and beautiful history. And we live in a 100-year-old house, but it does not look like this. Um, this is really And so I I'm, thank you for coming out today. Um, much of my work um, decades has focused on women voters after suffrage. And so a lot of the centennial year, and rightly so, the story of women who worked so hard to forward was last appropriate now because what did women do with their ballots? What did women do to vote? So I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, women voters right after suffrage in the 1920s. Um, and one of the things I want to emphasize is in, those, in all these conversations is the diversity of women voters, right? There is no one woman voter. How and talk about women changed over time, but is actually some interesting. Was just on the and that women voters were um, was consistent. I'm going to talk twenties, and then I'm going to really briefly um, talk about um, uh, women voters today. And then uh, open it up to discussion. I'd like to talk. We're going to see ahead. The state's constitution. Um, right as it is be denied by the right. This is the exact thing as the 15th Amendment to the Constitution. Instead of sex, says. Or, or previous condition of servitude. We have limits and the opportunity to step forward. Or have an affirmative vote. This the state discriminate against you on the basis of it doesn't has to make sure that women can vote. And of course we know, and I'll talk about in the years the 19th Amendment, that there were many women, black women in the South, and immigrant women in other parts of the country that were not able to take advantage of this new right. Am I super loud or just kind of loud? I'm fine? Okay. I'm actually, I have hearing aids in, which is why I'm wearing this kind of a mask. So I, I'm loud for myself, and I, I'll be loud for everybody else too. So the question, of course, was what will women do, right? Um, the ratification of the 19th Amendment happens at the end of August 1920. There's only about eh, a couple of hundred year period, this constant sort of seeking to understand voters. What I want to do today is tell you what the first conventional wisdom was about women voters. Um, and that is that women's suffrage was a failure. Um, someone, another talk I gave once said that these would be an example of their hot takes. 1923. Is good magazine. All of or this women's suffrage been a failure, right? All work, all this agitation. Basically, it didn't work so great. I mean, when they there should be some for you. sums up the failure argument. The American woman won suffrage in 19. She seemed it is interested in it once she had it. Saying women did not turn out to vote. We fought so hard to give them this right and they don't use it. Let's go back. So showing you in the five elections after suffrage, 
1920 through 1936, the turnout of women in purple yellow. Right? As you can see, um, fewer, about 30 women turned out to vote in 1920 in states where they had not, that's not true, let me not say that, we'll just stick with that, 30, almost 70% of men turned out to vote in the uh, 1920. That's, both are going to increase, that's a story about how politics is changing in the 20s and going into the New Deal period. Um, and women's will increase at a sharper rate, so they're going to slowly grow together. It will not be until 1980 that women become more likely to vote in elections than men. It has been true since 1980. It's actually true that there are more women in the electorate since 1964. And you might ask, well, how do I write that? There are more women of voting age. We do not die. Um, and so even slightly lower rates uh, turn if there are more women, right, you're going to get uh, numerically more women. All right. Turns out it's a little bit more complicated than that. And let me explain what I, I love, this, but let me explain what I'm doing here. This turnout in 1920 in 10 different American states, Virginia, uh, I don't know what happened there. That should be, thank you, Massachusetts. I know that it's Massachusetts. You just look weird on the screen. Connecticut, Oklahoma, Minnesota, Kansas, Illinois, Louisiana, Missouri, and Kentucky. I'm sorry I don't have Indiana. I'm happy about why. What I want you to see is that turnout varies a lot in American states. Okay? In Virginia, fewer than 10% of women turned out to vote in 1920. Now, the percentage of men turning out to vote is less than 40%. Okay, I'm going to talk about why that would be in just a second, right? Over here in Kentucky and Missouri, our neighbors, more than 50% of women turned out to vote in the first election in which they had the opportunity. So the question is, what makes Virginia, I also mentioned Massachusetts and Connecticut, where only about a quarter of women turned out to vote, different than places like Missouri and Kentucky. Right? That means these women's experience is women's experience, right? I want to emphasize two differences to you. One has to do with election administration. Constitution, other than those amendments I mentioned, actually says very little about voting. Voting is the province of states decide the rules, states decide who's eligible, how they're going to register voters, those sorts of things. In the 1920s, states like Virginia, yes, Virginia, Massachusetts, and Connecticut had pretty stringent electoral laws. They had poll taxes, literacy tests, requirements. You had to live in your address for six months a year before you were able to vote. Why? Virginia has a very large African-American population. This is a period in which the South cannot really be considered a democracy in the United States. It's authoritarian and uh, sort of putting down participation in general, right? And so the efforts of white Virginians, Virginians to keep these almost six, well, 40% of the population that's African-American in Virginia at this point from voting is a huge impact. And I, I'd love to tell more stories about that in, in just a second. Massachusetts and Connecticut also have literacy test polling, polling uh, taxes. This at Notre Dame, those Irish and Italian, everything. 60% of the population of Massachusetts and Connecticut are immigrant. So we're trying to stress the votes of huge places like Massachusetts and Connecticut. Missouri, Kentucky, no poll taxes, no literacy tests, no to sort of keep the vote down. To do. Box. Keep other if your family doesn't have a lot of money and you can afford one poll, you're going to use that tax. And it's a thing to you. League of Women Voters, uh, folks here, I will tell you the league from the very beginning. 
displays at play places at fairs at state fairs in in um, the windows of departments showing women they go in here and you pull this and you do this, right new stuff is hard and vote we know voting is a habit if you don't sort of learn how to do it but now that poll tax in many of the southern states all the poll taxes you missed in previous test or you're going to do sort of whatever that's that doesn't exactly excite you right the other difference between Massachusetts, Connecticut, over during this period. Distinct is that they're incredibly competitive. The Central College of Kentucky in 1920 were decided 0.05% of the vote. Depends when elections are right? there's more attention to them. The parties certainly aren't oh you're a woman just stay home saying every single voter we can get you know what will drive you there. are you worried about how to how to pull a lever or enter a ballot we will show you how to do that right we want every single um, of competition uh, among many states so here's why I want to in turnout in Virginia, and the almost 60% who turn out in Kentucky is enormous, right? It's much bigger than any of these differences, I should have said. So started with this. Uh, this is male turnout. The, the purple is women's turnout, right? So Connecticut, I know, has the biggest four-point gap in the turnout of men and women in Connecticut. But the difference between women in Virginia and women in Kentucky is bigger than any state. Your turnout depended more on where you lived than the fact that you were a woman, right? So, men are not the same. In part because all women live in the same political If you were a woman, won the right to in 1920 in Kentucky, you had a very different support system for you to vote. That if you were a woman to vote in Virginia, turn out of really again, there are bigger differences within women than there are between. Um, as I mentioned, uh, women are in purple, men are in mustard. See, they're very close. around a lot, more likely to turn out than they are today. Talk about um, Q and A. These differences, and this is keeping up with this, persist in interesting ways across groups. The turnout of women, women and men. This is Hispanic women and men, and oh, excuse me, this is um, other minority. This one is Hispanic. So what I want you to see is that there are certainly differences in, in overall rates of turnout between different ethnic groups. And we could certainly talk about why that is. What I also want you to see is that in all cases, the difference isn't huge, but women now turn out more than similar men do. The turnout of African American women is particularly notable and particularly Black women is white. Women. 
actually something political scientist. Church, if uh, you have a high income, all these sorts of things associated with their turnout. Women are more likely to poor than are very high. Found that in the black community, um, this very strong to and a of I vote for inspires black women of the twenty minutes. I'm gonna try and bring something what about now. Um, what are the thirties? Pink and blue ballots, ballot boxes. So before good service. And voted right, and so and the idea that women were a figure sort of made sense. The whole idea was that women weren't naturally political; they they you know didn't care about those sorts of things, and so it was easy to just say, "Oh, women just don't care." That makes sense, right? And then we thought, "Well, but my God, right? It's the 21st century. We have so many polls and so much information now, and we've learned so much. Surely." We're really good at figuring out how men and women vote today. So let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, we'll talk about the 2016 election. Uh, now we're we're entering, of course, into 2020. Um, this was, of course, a election. In dominated by a major party. We had probably in more than some years had a, a major party candidate for president who had not previously held political office or served the right? Um, that's not a statement about whether or not business good president is a reality, right? Together with the first woman president, excuse me, and um, a candidate who I think it's fair to say has, has been caught about women, the predictions were the gender gap is going to be huge, right? My gosh, all these women are going to vote for the woman candidate and against Trump. And somehow we thought men, however, are okay with those things. I don't really know what was happening there. But um, right, this sort of presumption. So I want to talk just briefly about what we mean when we say the gender gap in American politics and how that played out in, um, in, in 2016. All right, what is this graph showing? From now, 2016, this line indicates the percent of women who voted Democratic minus the percent of men who voted Democratic. Okay, what does that mean? It means when the line is below zero, that means that women voted more Democratic, uh, excuse me, more Republican than men did. Okay, they were more likely to choose uh, uh, Republican candidates. And that was, of course, was actually the case in the 1950s through to 1960. So are there all these newspaper stories about women swooning over John Kennedy? Um, they're quite fun to read. The reality is that Richard Nixon got more of women's votes than John Kennedy did in, in 1960. Turns out the swooning is not the perfect vote predictor that we had hoped it was going to be. Um, I, I want to mention that this is actually a worldwide phenomenon. Um, it's often referred to as the traditional gender gap. All around the world, in other advanced industrial democracies, women were more likely to write parties in the period immediately after. So in the 40s, 
countries sort of varied, right? And when they enfranchised um, women. Um, and so any explanation really needs to sort of think about these things um, globally, excuse me. Starting in the 1980s, this is like above the line, but not always statistically significant. We don't need to worry about that. Um, women, of course, are more democratic. Um, that is to say, women are more likely to vote for Democrats than men are. Now, as I'm going to show you, that often to take to mean that most women vote Democratic. I'm not saying that. I'm saying they're more likely to vote Democratic than men. So you can imagine a situation in which 80% of women voted Republican and 90% of men voted Republican. There would still be a gender gap. Women would, in fact, be more likely to vote for Democrats, right? The, the flip. But they're over both overwhelmingly voting um, for Republicans. Um, and that is not quite those high of numbers, but that is actually the case um, for white women through most of this, this history. So one of the, the, the with the you know, sort of election focus on the gender gap is we get this impression that women are overwhelmingly democratic. And I'm going to say again, women are diverse and different. And some women vote Democratic and some women vote Republican because it turns out women have their own brains and they make up their own decisions. And they're not just guided by um, their sex. And I, you can write that down and, and quote me on that. Um, now, I, you know, I, I want to make two notes because I just can't stop this. Um, <laughs> it's, <laughs> can you imagine being my student? It's exhausting. Um, when we talk about the gender gap, we also really focus on women, right? I just said women vote more this way, right? And, and what's happening there is a very long tradition of whatever men do is normal. And if women do something different, then we have to explain that, like what, what sort of just happened there. One of the things I want to point out about the gender gap is that at least initially, it was more a function of the behavior of men. What do I mean by that? Um, this is percent uh, identifying with the Democratic Party, again, from 1952 until 2016. Purple is women, uh, the, um, uh, the gold is men. And again, you can see women are less democratic here in the 50s and 60s. In 1964, they're very similar. Now, you see this big, right? This is, this is LBJ's landslide against Goldwater. Okay, so the, the largest landslide in American history. Um, enormous. And then men and women become more Republican, right? They move away from the Democratic Party. But men move much more sharply uh, than women do. And so the truth is the gender gap, at least initially, is more of a function of the behavior of men. And this is a story of, of realignment. This is, you know, 64, 65 is also when Democrats become the party of civil rights. Uh, and a lot of this is the movement of Southern white men away from the Democratic Party. Southern white women move too, uh, but not nearly as um, sharply. You know, when you give talks, you're supposed to give like one or two like points and then just make them over and over again. And I'm just throwing like 70 of them out to you. So I apologize. Um, believe it or not, this is a cut down version um, of this presentation. So I want to come back to this gender gap. 2016, first woman nominee running against this unusual uh, nominee. Obviously, this is 2012, right? We're supposed to have a huge gender gap. This thing should go way up. So I'm going to now show you the 2016 gender gap. Prepare yourselves. Let me show it again. I know, it's exciting, isn't it? <laughs> How could this be? How could this possibly be? Um, one of the things I like to tell my students, and I have more hidden graphs if, if you, you know, twist my arm. Um, 2016 was an unusual election in all sorts of ways. Just. I, I could sort of list them off. Um, many of us who study women in politics went into 2016 like this is our year, our expertise, we are ready. Uh, and it turned out a woman nominee was like the 10th most interesting thing that happened um, that year and that we've all been trying to understand um, since then. But once people showed up on election day, it was a normal election. 90% uh, of men and women who think of themselves as Democrats voted for the Democratic 90% of men and women who think of themselves as Republicans had voted Republican in the past, et cetera, for the Republican nominee. We're in a period of incredibly strong partisan identity, and again, I'm happy to talk about that as well, um, where in the end, no matter the term sort of brought both of them to their nomination, once they were given the, the, the choice, the Democrat or the Republican, 
people almost, and, and I should say, at similar rates to every other election, stuck with the party that they had long supported. Now, what I want to say, though, of course, is that any like gap is going to mask really interesting differences among women. And I just want to talk about a couple of those real quickly. These graphs are a little odd. I use them for lots of different things. Um, this is the percent of women and men who voted for Donald Trump in 2016. This is uh, among whites. This is among blacks. Okay. I want you to see two things in this graph. I want you to see that among both whites and African-Americans, there's a gender gap. Men were more likely to vote Republican than women were. And then I want you to see that the difference in the voting behavior of white women and black women is much larger than any gender difference. Race is a huge predictor of vote choice. So both male and female, more than almost 60% in women's case, more than 60% in men's case, voted for the Republican candidate in 2016. Among African Americans, very few voted for the Republican candidate. Rather, um, an overwhelming percentage of black voters voted for the Democrat. That is, by the way, not particularly different. Um, what this actually usually shows is 2012 and 2012. That it doesn't really um, um, look that different. But it turns out it's even more complicated than that, right? So women really differ. Here's white women and here's black women. They really differ in terms of um, their race and their perceptions of their interests and uh, the candidates that they support. But they differ in other ways as well. So let's complicate this even more and talk about education. not let me go anywhere. I'm teaching mostly on Zoom now. My students are just watching me do this on the camera. <laughs> it's really appealing. All right. This graph is showing only for white women, excuse me, only for whites. Um, whites without a, without a college degree in 2016, whites with a college degree in 2016. I'm not making, again, a judgment. I'm just sort of differences. So what you're going to see it's two things, right? So this is white men without a college degree, white women without a college degree, white men with a college degree, white women without a college degree. As you can see, whites without a college degree are much more likely to vote Republican than are whites without a college degree. That is actually an enormous shift. When I was in graduate school 25 years ago, there were like certain laws that came down on the tablets. And one of them is that college degree is positively associated with voting Republican. And so this shift, which also looks similar if we link rural, urban, income, these sorts of things, is really changing our politics in really dramatic ways today. And it's doing so for both men and women. Note that so enthusiastic are white women without a college degree for Donald Trump that the, there's not even a normal gender gap. They're actually slightly more Republican than white men without a college degree. One of the things I always say about that is, you know, we've had all these stories in the New York Times since 2016 where we go into these diners in Pennsylvania and interview working class men to figure out, you know, their opinions. We're doing it wrong. We should be talking to the waitresses, right? That's, that's, and this is actually quite a swing. So I said not much changed. Actually, this is a dramatic increase. So uh, white women without a college degree moved pretty dramatically to Donald Trump in 2016. And I assure you that his campaign is spending a really big amount of their time trying to keep those voters in 2020. Story over here is different. Um, white men with a college degree are more Republican than our white women uh, with a college degree. Um, and look at this difference, right? This is among white women. Whether or not you have a college degree has a pretty big difference among whites in how you're going to vote um, in elections. And that really is emerging as a bigger and bigger difference over the last 20 years. And it's important because there's lots of um, sort of consequences that flow out of that um, divide. I'm going to show you something similar for black voters. And here's what I want to say to you. Um, you'll notice these black lines that keep showing up. That's how confident you can be in these estimates from survey results. Count more diverse population is that our surveys of about 1,000 people do a really good job at sort of getting us close to good estimates of the population as a whole. But they're not so great for minority populations. Once you get down to just black voters and then men and women and then whether or not they're college educated, right, there's just not very many people. Estimates are, are pretty wide. 
there are no, you'll see, black lines around college-educated black women, excuse me, black men and black women. And that's because the best estimate is that zero college black men and black women voted Republican in 2016. So we're still seeing this case where those without a college degree are more than Donald Trump in the black population. Um, but it's such an extreme difference that, um, again, is, you know, that doesn't mean there was actually no one, but the unlikely um, outcome. I'm here to tell you what to do in 2020. Everyone just prepare themselves. Um, this slide is blank for a reason. Um, 2016 was very humbling for political scientists, although maybe not in the ways people think. Uh, it's not that polls that are bad, but uh, life is complicated. My best guess is actually that women will continue to be diverse. There'll almost certainly be a gender gap. Will it be big enough? Um, I think the thing to really keep in mind about the gender gap today, <sighs> there's been a gender gap for, what are we going on now? Four it rarely decides elections, right? So if 60% of women vote for the candidate and 65% of men vote for the candidate, that's a gender gap, but the candidate was gonna win either way. We are in a period now, the last 20 years, of incredibly close competition, right? We've had more elections where the, um, the popular vote and the electoral college vote go in different directions in the last 20 years than in most of, uh, certainly any other period in American history. The House and the Senate, you know, when I was growing up, the, Democrat, the Democrats controlled the House since the beginning of time. Um, they now flip back and forth all the time. In an odd way, this means that the gender gap matters more. And the likelihood that, right, if elections are really close and women are just more likely to vote for Democrats than our men, and they're just more likely to turn out to vote, the possibility that they're sort of going to make that difference um, in a state, right? We still have that electoral college in our, for our friends in Michigan up north, for example, um, gets higher and higher. So with that, I'm going to stop. Thank you for your attention, and I would love to hear your questions. Yes. Did I hear you say in one of your earlier I went through a lot. That in around 1920, America was not a democracy. I said that the southern states would not be considered a democracy, in, in a, an electoral democracy, in the sense that an electoral democracy requires free and fair elections um, in which there's actual contestation. So in general elections in the south in the 1920s, turnout was extraordinarily low and one party sort of had it in the bag. What that meant is that real competition in the South happened within Democratic primaries. Those were, um, by law, uh, only uh, allowed white participants um, and, and were decided usually by party elites rather than by a, a really vigorous primary system like we have today. Well, I think now, when there's still some states that have, it seems like they're doing quite a bit of that as well. Um, so that's a really great question. It's a great question about elections, and it's a great question more broadly. Um, democracy is not a yes or no. I made it sound like that, but it's a continuum, right? And so, um, and it's a continuum that has many different dimensions. So one continuum is free and fair elections. Another continuum might be the rule of law. Um, and that is to say that, you know, your political opponents just don't get jailed because you don't like them and everybody's subject to the same laws and you have independent courts and all those sorts of things. That'd be another dimension of democracy. There are definitely states in the United States where it is um, much harder for many Americans to exercise their right to vote than in other states. Um, and that's, that's, on one side of the continuum rather than, you know, if you vote for the opponent, we throw you in jail and torture you or you're disappeared, right? Or we don't hold elections at all, or we have other parties. There are places like that, right? Um, so we're definitely on the democracy side, but I think democracy is always a goal. It's not where we are, right? It's, it's, it's sort of more perfected. Um, and there are certainly models around the world um, of countries that definitely make it easier for people to vote. Um, one of the things that's happened in the last, certainly in the last four years, has been, for those of us who say the United States, we're sort of famous for being um, 
the ugly American. I care nothing outside these borders, right? This is vacation land, but I will only study my own, um, uh, my own uh, exceptional country. Um, and there are many ways in which the United States is exceptional. Um, but for us to understand this political moment, it's really important for us to look at other democracies around the world, and there are people doing that sort of work and asking, are there problems with our courts right now, right? Historically, um, and, and certainly a, a lot of these sort of crass national measures of democracy would say the United States had a problem until 1920 when it, when it um, expanded the vote to women and until 1965 with the Voting Rights Act. Right? And so, um, not that we weren't a democracy, but we weren't a full electoral democracy when, when there was such consistent um, discrimination against certain groups. I give really long answers like that to everything, so you have been warned. Yes? I, I may have missed it. Why is it that men are not voting as much as women? Why aren't men voting as much as women? Um, That's a good question. <laughs> um, one of the things we're learning um, is um, the importance of sort of college education. Um, or just, I mean, what it means to have an advanced education changes over time, right? So for my grandparents, finishing high school made them an exception to many of the people in their own communities. Um, you know, when women got the right to vote, only about 6% of the U.S. population had a college degree. Um, it still remains a minority position. Um, I have to remind my students of that, right? Notre Dame students, this is not normal. <laughs> you know, like, this, this is not a, a, a normal thing. Um, and this is one place where women have really pushed ahead pretty dramatically. And so for the last 10 or 15 years, it, it takes a while because the population has to move through, but certainly among younger Americans, the rate at which women uh, finished degrees uh, is much higher um, than it is among men, and, and that seems to be something of an advantage. Um, most of the graphs I showed you were sort of the population overall. Um, one of the consequences of our carceral state is that there are many black men in particular who no longer have access to the ballot because they've done some time in prison. Um, I don't want to overstate the impact of that, but it does have an impact. Um, and then there's the other piece, right? Um, there's sort of the gender dynamics in homes. Who gets the family to go to church in the morning? Who remembers to fill out the thing and goes to the community events? Who is this afternoon, morning, whatever we're, we're in? Um, um, and, and so that sense of duty um, um, seems to be, duty and obedience are things that we know are, women are more strongly socialized to um, than men are. And that may be part of what's happening as well. I've given a million talks and no one has asked me that specific question. And I'm really like, I just said, like we should pay more attention to men's behavior, not just women's. And I'm like, wow, that's a really good question. Are, are younger men not voting for the ratio that older men are voting? So I would have to look at the data. No. Um, the truth is we always talk about the youth vote. I certainly would love to see all of my students and every young person participate. Um, rates of turnout among younger Americans are pretty low, and they always have been. You know, you're moving around, you're getting education. It's just, it's a harder thing to do than when, you know, you're me and you've lived in the same house for 20 years and you're more rooted in your community. Um, so my guess, if I went and looked at the data, and I'm now like, where's the Pew data? That Pew is a really good source. They have beautiful graphs. I really recommend their site. Um, I would guess yes. I would guess yes. Yes? When you go into a voting booth, you have to make a choice between two candidates. You can vote for a candidate, or you can vote against the other candidate. Do your statistics break that um, So nothing that I've shown you today, but that's actually of great interest to um, political scientists right now. Um, and what, what the way we would put that second category is we would call that negative partisanship. You're not saying, I love my candidate, I love my party, I really want to support them. You're saying, I just cannot stand this other party, I cannot stand um, this other sort of person. Um, and the truth is, we see more of that sort of voting, again, what I would call negative partisanship rather than positive partisanship, yay, my team, right, versus I just want those, that team to lose, has been growing in the last 20 years. If it feels like things have become more partisan and more polarized, 
Um, I could bring you a whole other set of graphs that would agree with you entirely, right? And we use all sorts of creative measures. Would you be upset if your child married someone from the other political party? Um, would you know? Uh, but but and also just asking people exactly that: Were you voting for Donald Trump? Or were you voting against Hillary Clinton? And I'm sure you asked the question. I'm sure all of you are thinking of people you know, or maybe yourself, who did more of the. I wasn't thrilled, thrilled with our nominee, but I definitely didn't want the other party. Um, what's interesting is that the last, the, the sort of reason that we see that is we're in a period where all of our identities, and that's part of what we've been talking about here, are sort of lined up. What do I mean by that? I mean that, um, how do I say this? If you're secular and belong to a labor union and are a woman and I, I literally can't think of other identities, and are uh, African-American, right? You're probably going to vote Democratic. All those identities sort of line up together. And if you're um, evangelical Christian and a white man and in corporate America, you're probably going to vote for the Republican. A society, and this is something that since Madison and the Federalist Papers we've recognized, a society tends to work better if we have more cross-cutting cleavages where maybe my religious identity encourages me to vote Republican, but I belong to a labor union, so I want to vote Democratic. Or um, uh, Germans in the late 19th century tended to vote Republican. On the other hand, I had this opinion on prohibition or something else. Um, when all those identities line up, it's hard, as we've all seen, for people to sort of reach across. Right? I might say, um, I'm a Catholic and I'm, I'm going to vote Republican because I really care about um, uh, abortion and, and other sorts of issues like that. But when I go to work, I interact with different people who have different sorts of views. That still happens, but not as much as it happened in the past. The last time we had such dramatic sort of negative partisanship was the end of the 19th century. We also had these identities lining up. It, it's not great for politics as you might have noticed. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I also want to be respectful of people's time Absolutely. At, the, at the end of the program as well. So let's give a round of applause. Thank you. My pleasure. And if you, uh, if you have additional questions, you want to stick around, I'll, I'll kind of release people to go. But before we do that, a reminder, next uh, month's gallery talk is going to be October 2nd, and it's going to feature Karen Nicholson. She's going to be talking about the secrets found within quilts. Mm. Secrets within quilts. And so, uh, again, thank you all. If this is your first experience with Ruth Mir, uh, uh, welcome here today. Please know that Ruth Mir is a member-supported, donor-supported organization. We're not connected to any of the tax rates. Dollars. We exist in the graces of our members and donors, and so experience today is something that you think, hey, that was really cool. I'd like to support that. I'd like to go to more of those. I, I want to be part of that. We're happy to help you out and give you many opportunities to consider different ways to support us, either volunteerism, financially, or otherwise. So thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.